Hi everyone, Jen T with Aringo here. And today we are joining GMAC Club as we do the application walkthroughs. So for today, um, right now we're gonna go over Michigan Ross. And so some general information that we wanna talk about for applications is that each MBA program has crafted their own application. They're usually pretty dynamic and change with the different information that you put in. Um, so today we're gonna do pretty much a, a generic version of the application. But if you decide to do dual degrees um, or special programs, et cetera, sometimes those will change. So I highly recommend before you start working on the application itself, that you walk through each part of the application and be able to get familiar with it so that you don't do some work that needs to be done at the end, that needs to that you did at the beginning, et cetera, and you don't get lost. So um, before we jump in really quickly, I'm going to be checking on the Q&A um, as we go through um, and be able to kind of answer any questions that we can get answered. So um, questions about applying in round one versus round two. Honestly, most MBA programs are going to be holding spots in round one and round two, um, almost at an equal proportion, maybe a little bit more in round one. So no worries um, if your application isn't ready for round one, then submit in round two. Same thing for scholarships, too. Um, OK, does it add value if a reapplicant denied in round three to write essays or leave it blank? Great, great question. And again, we can talk about that on um, we will talk about the essays uh, on August 10th, but briefly, it, it you need to um, actually write new new essays or at least refresh them. Um, okay, and I think that we can go ahead and get started. All right, so this is the Michigan Ross portal. When you get started, you're going to say you want to start your application um, and as the portal brings everything up, I'm not going to dive into some of the generic parts of the application because, you know, it's pretty normal, but I'll make sure to address anything that is specific about this. And um, as we get started, don't forget to like, save, bookmark, share this presentation so that um, you can come back to it later. Okay, so here we do, here we go. So this is the Michigan Ross application that are going to ask you to sign that you agree to all of the terms of submitting the best possible application with the most accurate information um, without any sort of cheating or fraudulence. It's getting started. Um, what we'll see here is, you know, they're going to ask some basic information about your background about your degrees, you know, did you apply before? The important thing to see here is dual degrees. If you are deciding that you want to apply to multiple programs at the same time, then you can select here if you're wanting to apply to a dual degree in program when you're planning to do that. And if you're currently enrolled at University of Michigan, which is kind of rare, but if you are, you want to put that in there. And then you want to select the dual degree program that you are most interested in applying to. Um, a lot of the times um, our candidates are typically in you know, more interested in potentially um, engineering or uh, law or um, some sort of public policy or public health. So, you know, you can select that here. And again, sometimes these drop downs make the application change a little bit and may offer new prompts for being able to enter information, answer questions. So just know that what we're going through today is going to be generic. Um, and it may change for you specifically if you add something else. So this is another part that I want to go over, and this is the application fee waiver. Now, um, Ross has quite a few different, uh, actually, are you seeing this screen? Um, and you just choose from the drop down there. The next is application fee waivers for Ross. So they give a couple of different options. Um, for, you know, who could be receiving an application fee waiver. Another one is if you registered and attended at least one Ross event. Now, <laughs> here's the caveat to this, is that you want to make sure that you're being honest. These schools use CRM systems to be able to track who has attended events. And so they'll, 
either be able to link it up via name or your email address, whichever one you use to register for the event. And so, you know, be honest in this because again, they can check it if they really wanted to. I'm not sure that they will, but just know that it could happen. So, um, all right. Next. So next is going to be your personal information. Again, this is all pretty unique to you specifically, but pretty boring for the most part. Um, they do ask about gender, transgender, and this these questions aren't about like identifying you specifically. They're much more of thinking about how they can support you as a student um, within their program. So just know that you can um, include this and not feel like it's going to be part of your actual application for decisions, but much more of the you know, how do we support you as a student? Are there student clubs or activities that we feel like will most appeal to you, including like this, like marital status. If you're married, um, they might send you more information about the spouses club. Um, I think that there's a question typically about if you have children. And so they're going to talk about Ross families and et cetera. So just know that these are um, this information isn't necessarily used to make decisions about your admission, but more of giving them insights to who you are and how they can best support you as a student. Um, all right, your contact information, your permanent address. Now, I would say that this part is important. So if they're going to send you mail, um, if you're going to be moving or anything like that, um, especially as you get closer to the actual um, date that you would start the program, you'll want to update, like give them a permanent address maybe of your parents or a sibling or somebody who maybe is not moving, just in case you need to make sure that your mail goes somewhere. Um, so if you are a military, um, if you are in the military, you can list this and choose which part of the military branch you're in. This is also helpful for them to connect you with the Military and Veteran Association. And then you'll go through more information. Um, another, you know, kind of generic question here is that, you know, are you a first gen college student? And so this gives them a little bit of insights, like maybe if you had a rough start to your academic career, lower grades during that beginning part, then they can say like, OK, well, the transition to college was a little bit tougher because maybe you didn't have as much advice going into the process. And that gives them a little bit more understanding. Um, all right. And then if you, they want to know if you attended at a minority serving institution, these are mostly here in the U S. So if so, you can always click on these. Um, and then are you going to be, um, anybody going to be sponsoring you for the program itself? And you can click yes or no. They'll ask you what company or organization, and then what amount or percentage they're going to be sponsoring you. The next part of this is for you to start talking about your career, right? Like why you want to be here. And so you want to talk about your career interest. So if that's, if any of these, or well, one of these should definitely apply to you, you will pick, you know, the area that you're most interested in. And then the secondary area. So um, energy and entrepreneurship. So you want to do a startup in that arena. Um, and then that helps them with knowing um, kind of what classes are going to be best fit for you, what clubs are going to be best fit for you, and making sure that they're offering things that you're looking for. Um, and then next, they're going to ask you about how you've heard about them. Um, and I really think that, you know, this is your opportunity to shine a little bit about, you know, like that I talk to current students or alumni, um, or, you know, where you were able to find the information. But I would oh, look, look at that gmatclub.com. You can put that there. Um, so, you know, again, you can share a little bit about your background. Now, this is one part of the application. Um, several different applications, INSEAD, Columbia, um, Ross, I believe there's a couple others that are going to ask you what connections have you had with our school that have been able to like help you, you know, in this process. And you should never leave this blank ever. Like, because if you do, you're saying, eh, I mean, like, I did my research and I know enough, right? But what you need to do is tell them, you know, how you got to know about them, what events you did attend, what students or alumni you spoke with. And this is important because this is helping them, helping convince them 
that Ross is your number one choice because you've done all this research and you know that it's the right fit for you, even though you maybe live thousands of miles away on another continent. You're being able to prove, hey, I've done my due diligence and I know Ross is for me. So make sure you fill that out on any school. You want to make sure you put that information there. Some of the information in all applications are optional, like parental information, such as name contact. Is there any advantage or disadvantage for filling out the information about your family? So great, we're on this page. So with that being said, it is optional. Some of the things that they're going to ask for are going to give them more insights about you. So if you do have a spouse or a partner, absolutely, you want to include that so that they know who's helping influence the decision that you make, right? Like if you have a spouse, typically they're going to say, yes, we're ready to move to Ann Arbor, Michigan. And sometimes they might say, oh, it's too cold. Um, so, you know, you want to be able to list if you have a spouse or a partner, any children, that type of thing. And then that they are also asking if they're applying. And so oftentimes people ask if we're applying as a couple, is there an advantage? Well, technically there's not, but if you're both applying and one of you is more competitive than the other, they may say, well, to get so-and-so to come, then we admit, the, you know, the spouse, um, or, you know, they kind of know that they have a two for one deal. If they admit one, then the other, um, then you both will come. And that means that there's two admits right there that are going to kind of guarantee that they're going to come. So um, you can be truthful in filling this out. Is it a true advantage? Technically, no, but it could play out later on. Um, so parental information, they leave this optional just in case, right? Like this is, this could be some tender information for people, you know, whether your parents have passed or you don't know them, anything like that. So it's optional in that way. But the listing of like the op um, the occupation of your parents, that type of thing, and what level of education, again, gives them a little bit more insight into your background, what kind of help and assistance you had along the way, and how they can kind of perceive your application and look for opportunities of either disadvantages or resilience. So it's up to you if you want to include it. There's no true disadvantage for it, um, but you can leave them blank if you want. Um, all right. So that is that. And um, the next thing is, like, do you have anybody that you know that was an alumni? And you can fill this out. And so in undergrad, they usually call this like legacy. Like, so, you know, like somebody else in my family attended, like a sister, or brother, or parent, whatever. Adding that again, reaffirms your knowledge and understanding of the school on a much deeper level if it's a relative who attended. Okay, so next, sorry, I have some post-it notes just to make sure I stay on track and answer any questions that you might have. Um, all right, previous education. So this is the opportunity for you to share what you've done in your undergrad. Um, you should be able to search for your institution within this um, within this search. If not, you can always add it. And then whenever they get your transcripts, they can do some configuration to make sure that everything aligns. Um, so you'll put the dates that you attended, your major degree, they ask a lot of information. But the bigger part is they ask you for a GPA converted on a 4.0 scale. Now, knowing that across the globe, a 4.0 scale is not as common, then you can do some rounding on your own. And you can also use this in, um, GPA scale below to also help you with articulating where you were um, in your class or as far as like your um, academic performance. And so you can either list your percentage or points and then the total points that it was out or the scale that was used. So if you're on a CGPA scale of 10, then you can list, you know, 8.99, and then they'll be able to see that it's out of 10, um, where that might not feel as fantastic when you convert it to a 4.0 scale. Um, just know that they're open and understand that across the globe, there's definitely different scales of GPA. Um, yeah. Okay. So next is transcripts. The only caveat to this is that you only need to upload unofficial transcripts. You do not um, 
have to get the official ones until after you're admitted. Um, so you can add any additional institutions here as well. So now we're going to talk about test information for Ross. Um, so again, um, you want to be able to put in your scores, but they do have the ability to ask for a waiver. Um, so this is an option that you have with Ross. Not everybody has this option. So, you know, you can definitely um, ask for the waiver. And here's kind of a couple of things to, to do that. Um, and then statement of academic readiness. Please demonstrate why you're ready to meet the academic rigor without an exam. And so you can discuss your quantitative background, alternative transcripts, courses, degrees, any sort of trainings that you had, this is your opportunity to share that with the committee as to why you would um, need the um, or meet the waiver requirements. If you are putting in your GMAT GRE, it is going to be asking for a lot of information. So make sure that you have your um, test results up. Um, they're going to ask you to upload the unofficial score report that you received, and then um, later on, they'll ask you to report it to the school. Same thing for TOEFL or any sort of English proficiency. And I think, she, think I can go to the next page. Next is going to be employment. So they're going to be asking how many months of employment do you have or how many years. They're going to calculate that for you. Um, and then from there, select which industry best fits your background and then the function that you had. So here's the thing. So employment history gives you the opportunity to put a lot more of those nitty gritty details here versus taking space up on your resume. So think about like if you are a chartered accountant, CFA folder, first of all, I would make sure to put that in the name of your resume. So like if it said like Jen Turchinell, comma, ACCA or CA, whatever it might be, but you can put that in the title like or on your um, header with your name, comma, and like CFA, whatever it might be so that you're not using space on your resume to put that in there. You will add it within the form itself, but you don't have to have like a bullet point about it later on, um, taking up room on your application. Um, then they'll ask you to upload the file of the certification. Um, so next, with employment, you want to be as accurate as possible um, because later on in life, when you get admitted, they're going to be doing background checks and they're going to be looking at the data that has to do with time frame that you worked for them um, and salary and position. So they're not necessarily seeking a reference, but they're fact checking um, and during their background check. And so, you know, be as accurate as you possibly can. Um, sometimes on your resume, you may have like a more illustrious title versus what you're called in the system and the HR system for your job. So, you know, make sure that they match when it comes to the employment section so that later on there's no question about it. Like if there was a conflict, they're going to ask you to help, you know, share information about it. And, but just rather not go through all that by being accurate as you, as you can, as accurate as you possibly can be in the actual um, employment form itself. And then they do ask for a reason for leaving. Um, in this, you want to make sure that you are being as tactful as possible. So like if you were leaving because you had a horrible manager, I wouldn't put that, right? Like you want to be tactful and say, you know, you know, I was seeking um, the opportunity to gain more responsibilities and career growth or something like that. Um, I'm always happy to help you with determining how you want to write that later on. But, you know, you want to be tactful and um, polite in the, these as well. Um, all right. So I think that's all for this page for employment. Okay. Um, next part that I wanted to talk about. So obviously each one of these schools are going to have their own essays. You'll want to be able to make sure you're answering that prompt. Again, we're going to go deep diving into these essays on August 10th. So come back and join us for that specific um, deep dive into the essays and how to answer them. Um, right now, we're just going to kind of quickly touch on the actual part itself uh, or like the essay submission part itself. So 
like I said, they have different requirements um, for each school, 300 words. They want you to upload a document um, with the 11.5 font and 1.5 um, spacing. So follow that and upload it into the application. Next, um, part two, I think is a really cool part about um, Ross is that they're giving you the option to choose which question you want to answer. So whichever one makes you feel like you have the best answer for, I would absolutely use that essay, which one, you know, best speaks with you. Um, so we would upload that um, career aspirations, make sure that that matches kind of to what we entered into the interest section of the application and kind of aligns. Optional essay, a lot of people have questions about optional essays and you want to use the optional essay to answer any questions the committee might have about your application that you're not answering either in your resume or your, um, your essays themselves. So like, let's say you have a career gap that's a great opportunity to talk about that. Or um, if you started school and had a medical issue and um, had to leave school, but you had really bad grades or something like that because of that, or something happened in your family or anything that kind of happened that caused your grades to be lower, but maybe recovered, this is an opportunity to you know explain that. And it doesn't need to be a full on essay. Optional essays can be as easy as there are three things I want to share with the Ross admissions committee about my application. One, you'll notice that there's an employment gap um, due to COVID. I was laid off. Two, you know, you'll notice my academic grades during my freshman year were low, and that is because of X, Y, and Z. So again, it can be very easy and to the point. It does not have to be an eloquent essay. You're just making sure you're filling any gaps that the committee may have about you. Um, then again, we're going to attach our resume, upload that I, optimally via PDF. And then this is something interesting about Russ is they ask for a photo. You don't have to do it, but if you do, great, because I think it just, um, once you get admitted, then they kind of put a face to the name, um, but it's not part of the application process itself. I'll, really quickly, I'm going to finish up. So recommendation letters, you're going to put the recommenders details in here. Um, if you choose a recommender who is not your direct supervisor, explain why. Again, super easy and simple. Put that there. And then the bigger part is, do you waive the right to view the recommendation? The answer I would recommend is yes. You want to waive it because if you say no, then it tells the recommender, if I'm not admitted, I'm going to go back and read that letter of recommendation. And if you wrote something bad about me, then it's your fault, right? So you want to take that off, that onus off of your recommender um, and say that you're going to waive your right to see it. Then this, it does not submit to your recommender. It does not send them an email until you hit this button. A lot of people think it's when you submit the application, it's when you submit via this button. So just kind of have that in mind. Um, all right. Next um, residency, this is about in-state tuition, et cetera. You don't really have to worry too much about that. I mean, well, if you do, then you know what you're doing. Um, then beyond this um, criminal activity, the business community statement and honor code, you're going to be signing this year. Um, if you answer any, yes to any of these, then you'll fill out this blank. And then I would, if you are filling out yes to any of these crime or conduct um questions, then I would ask for some help on doing that. And then lastly is the um, last part is this application certification. They may use AI detection devices or tools to see if you used AI to write your application. So this agreement is saying that I did this. I did not use AI to help me with this. Um, and you're submitting it in you know, certifying that you did that. So, okay. So very quickly, <laughs> that was <laughs> the, the Ross MBA application walkthrough.